Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. If you're new to minis, you'll notice there are a number of controls and switches. Today's topic of discussion is on the choke cable, specifically how the system works, how to make adjustments, and the common problems that I find related to the choke itself. So let's go over to the bench and I'll break down how the choke system works first before I get into my adjustments and also the top problems I run into when I go out for tuning. Before I get into discussing the choke operation on all three of these carburetors, I want to talk about the symbols you're most likely to see on your choke cable. So the first one, which from the intro, is that double blade style. The second shot you'll see is the C label. This is just stands for choke, C for choke. And then the third style you're most likely to see is this uh, partial butterfly symbol which was found on the, the real later cars. Now, understanding the choke system really requires an understanding of the history of choking itself. A basic definition of the word choke is a reduction in airflow, and its symbol is derived from this definition. For instance, on a wood stove, a choke refers to the control for letting air into the stove. This control changes how the wood will burn due to the available air flowing into the stove. More air equals faster wood burning, less air equals slow wood burning. So what does this antiquated symbol have to do with our cars? Well, the combustion of gasoline requires air and fuel to burn. Air comes in the carburetor here, fuel comes in via the fuel line, intake manifold to the engine to get burned, generating pressure and propelling us forward. To start the engine, you need to get both the air and the fuel into the cylinder in the correct ratio so the spark plug can ignite the mixture. If there's too little fuel or too much air, then ignition cannot occur. The problem with gasoline is that it's mostly liquid at room temperature. If you put a drop of it into a cylinder and try to ignite it with a spark plug, it wouldn't. The gas needs to be turned from a liquid into a vapor before the spark plug can ignite the air-fuel combination. So how do carburetors turn fuel into fuel vapor? The answer is the Venturi effect. So I've drawn a stylized carburetor. The air intake is on the right hand side here. This is the throttle butterfly. This is the piston. Now, fuel in liquid form is sitting in the jet. Let's say this little black mark here is where the fuel is sitting. And there's a needle inside here, which controls the amount of fuel coming out of the jet tube. Well, the way the fuel comes out of the jet tube is that air is pulled into the engine. It rushes across this narrow gap right here. And the fuel gets pulled into the airstream in the form of tiny fuel droplets. Think of it as a cloud of gas droplets that get pulled off of this side. So it goes from liquid form into gaseous cloud droplet form over here. The droplet form of, of gas, or cloud, is what makes ignition possible. The finer the particles, the easier it is for the spark to contact the fuel particles and start the combustion process. As I mentioned before, the choke symbol itself represents a restriction in airflow. On a fixed jet carburetor, such as a lawnmower, the only way to increase the fuel supply for the initial start was to block off or restrict, i.e. choke, the available air here so that as the engine is turning over, it's drawing more fuel out of this jet because the vacuum that's generated here pulls, pulls the fuel out of the jet. The additional fuel obviously increases the chances of ignition to occur and therefore uh, makes it easier for the spark plug to ignite the fuel combustion and start the whole running condition of that fixed jet carburetor. Once the engine was started, the airflow could slowly be opened up so you'd slowly open up the, the restriction. And once it's warmed up, you'd have no airflow restrictions and you could start running the engine as you normally would. Fixed jet carburetors depend on the temperature of the engine and cylinder head in order to optimize the uh, fueling. The problem with a fixed jet design was that the airflow restriction would not be conducive to driving. So imagine 
blocking off most of the airflow to your car and then trying to drive somewhere. It just wouldn't be able to drive because it couldn't provide enough air to properly, you know, fill the cylinders in the block and provide combustion. So a restriction air intake choke setup would not would not work on a on a car if you needed to drive it. Now you could use it to start a car, but in order to drive, you need the restriction to be fully removed in order for airflow to properly flow through the carburetor. So instead of restricting the air intake, what SU did is they came up with a movable jet design. So as I rotate this lever here, you'll see the jet move downwards like that. So let's look at what this does on my stylized drawing here. So let's look at that movable jet thing. Now, the SU needle is a tapered profile. If you move the jet downwards and away from the needle, you increase the area between the jet and the needle. So as this moves down, you increase your effective amount of fuel exposed to this airstream, which provides more fuel into this cloud of gas, which allows your car to start quickly without the need of blocking the air intake. So that's the genius part. No airflow restrictions here. Just by moving the jet down, you've created an effective increase in jet service area for the fuel to flow through. So when do we need choke? We need it when there's insufficient heat in the manifold and the cylinder head to convert the fuel particles coming out of the carburetor into a vapor gas. On a cold day with a cold engine, such as this, the fuel particles being sucked into the intake and the cylinder head bang around against the intake manifold and the cylinder walls before they get into the engine itself. Since there's no energy absorbed by the fuel when it contacts these surfaces, the fuel droplets stay in droplet form all the way into the cylinder. Droplet form, once again, is hard to ignite. Therefore, we need more droplets to ensure ignition occurs. If the intake and the valve head surface temperature is greater than the temperature of the fuel droplets, the fuel will turn into a vapor or gas quite easily. In the gas state, ignition happens quickly compared to the droplet state. It means they have exhaust manifold heated manifolds or coolant heated manifolds require less choke time compared to those that do not have a source of manifold heat. Let's take a closer look at the actual operation of the choke components. So we have the throttle here with an adjuster screw. We have the choke lever with a cam profile here. There's a linkage bar connected to the jet down here. When I rotate this cam, you'll notice that initially nothing happens from here to here. And then it reaches a second stage where it pushes the jet downwards, creating that choking effect. The choke is designed this way so that you can pull the lever to increase idle speed before you add additional fuel. There are scenarios in which your car might be warm but not warm enough, or it's warm outside but your engine's not warm. You may not actually need the additional fuel, therefore SU gave you a, an option to provide just additional increase in idle speed before you add any additional fueling. This area here is probably one of the most misadjusted places that I find on SU carburetors. So if you're going by the book, the book says to rotate this fast idle cam to the point where it just about starts pushing on the jet. So I'd go to about there. Then it says adjust this screw until you achieve an idle of somewhere between 12 and 1300 RPMs on your car. Again, there are specifications in the book, which I will take a picture and put up here. The HIF series carburetor is a little different. It has a same cam design where it pushes on the throttle. So, you know, it gives you throttle adjustment and then it gives you choke enrichment. However, it doesn't necessarily have that two stage feeling to it. You're supposed to adjust your throttle screw to line up with the arrow when it's in contact with the screw head. So these two need to be parallel. That's the proper adjustment for an HIF series carburetor. And again, 
you can make small adjustments to the fast idle speed screw as needed to get your car to idle properly under the uh, first stage of the choke operation. The way that these two carburetors work is totally differently. Uh, this one, again, has been all about the moving jet. The HIF version actually has a secondary passageway cast into the manifold and drilled to provide a second passageway for fuel to flow out of the float chamber and into the intake. So there's not actually a moving jet. Um, it just exposes and then hides a, uh, a different passageway inside of here. So how much choke do we need? Well, that depends on a lot of variables. Obviously, engine temperature and air temperature are two critical ones. I always attempt to start my Mini without the choke, as it generally can start up on mild days such as late spring all the way until um, late fall. It typically doesn't need the choke. It may need the fast idle, but it typically does not need the enrichment portion. If it fails to start on my first attempt, I will pull the choke out to the high idle speed, try and start it. If it doesn't want to start on the high idle speed, I will start gradually pulling it further into the enrichment phase. But once it's started on the enrichment, I will typically get right back to the high idle speed before returning it to off once I've been driving for, say, a few minutes. In general, after a few minutes of driving, the choke and or any extra idle speed you've added is generally not needed as the heat from the cooling system and exhaust system has started circulating around and started improving the vapor uh, point of the fuel so it's causing the fuel droplets to go from a cloud into an actual gas form and therefore uh, you need you don't need the droplets or the extra enrichment anymore to maintain normal running conditions only use the full enrichment portion of the choke if it is absolutely necessary to start your mini do not let the car warm up in the secondary portion of choke. It will provide way too much fuel and can foul out the spark plugs as well as wash the oil off the rings and cause engine damage. Also, when you go and start it in this really rich position, it'll get started and then maybe 10, 15 seconds later, you'll start hearing the engine struggling against this much fuel. It does not need it. It's a chugging sound. I'll insert a bit of audio so you can hear what it sounds like at this level. But again, full enrichment just to get started, drop it down to high idle speed as soon as possible, and then once the car has any kind of warmth to it, you can return it to the off position. So there are my thoughts on using the choke and getting it all adjusted properly. If you guys thought this was interesting or helpful, let me know in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.